When the Honda S2000 launched, its engine had the highest power per liter of any naturally aspirated production car. But car is really the key word here, because for bikes, Honda's 240 horsepower from a 2 liter engine or 120 horsepower per liter was nothing special. And compare that to today, where Ducati's V4 engine can make nearly identical power to the S2000, but with just one liter half the size, albeit with a racing exhaust and special oil. But even in typical street legal form, it's making 218 horsepower per liter, nearly 100 horsepower more per liter than the S2000. Ducati's prowess has absolutely dominated MotoGP the past several years with their V4 engine, and this ridiculous engineering is available in a sport bike for us mortals. So let's talk about what makes it so special. So first, I want to provide a little more context because mostly on this channel I just talk about cars and so let's compare this to today's highest horsepower per liter naturally aspirated engine in a production car. So the Gordon Murray T50 has a 4 liter V12 cranking out 661 horsepower or about 165 horsepower per liter. Compare that to Ducati's V4 at 218 horsepower per liter. Leagues ahead. Now, now, in terms of torque per liter, the T50 actually does have the advantage, slightly more torque per liter, 88.5 pound-feet per liter versus 84.6. Uh, but the big reason, if you're looking at these two engines, why does this make more power per liter in the Ducati V4 versus the Gordon Murray Cosworth V12? Well, it's because it's revving higher to about 16,500 RPM versus 12,100 RPM redline on the T50. So when it comes to naturally aspirated engines, there are two big levers you can lean on in order to increase power. Of course, you can make the engine larger, very easy. The bigger the engine, the more power you're going to make. Or you can make the engine rev higher. This is a more difficult way of increasing power because as you start to rev higher, the engine just wants to destroy itself. So there's a real challenge in making an engine rev really high. And of course, that also brings up cost, right? If you want to make something rev really high, you start to use more exotic materials. You start to get into things where the price goes up. And so one of the interesting things I think about just comparing the highest naturally aspirated power per liter engine in the GMT 50 is that this is a vehicle that costs about three million dollars versus this Ducati which you can buy for fifty thousand dollars. You can buy 60 of them for the same price as a GMT 50 and you get this very exotic very racy engine that's going inside of it. So just covering some of the basic specs of this V4R engine it is a naturally aspirated one liter 90 degree V4 engine. It has a 70 degree crank offset, 81 millimeter bore, 48.4 millimeter stroke, of course that short stroke helping it rev high, and a 14 to 1 compression ratio. So for this video I want to focus on things that Ducati does differently. So for example why they chose a V4 engine layout. Why their engines spin the opposite direction of every other street bike out there and how they're able to handle such high engine RPM. But first, a quick message about the shoes that I'm wearing. This portion of the video is sponsored by Vessi, and I am thrilled about this partnership because I bought my first pair of Vessis two years ago, and they've been my daily driver ever since. If you've watched one of my videos over the past two years, this is almost certainly the shoe I was wearing. They're super comfortable, look great, they're grippy, easy to slip on without retying the laces, and my favorite part, they're genuinely waterproof. Vessi just sent me their latest Stormburst high top, which I can dunk in deep water and yet my socks stay completely dry. They've got all kinds of different styles, and again, as my daily, I found them great for any occasion. Even at two years old, my original Vessi shoes still stay completely dry on rain-soaked walks with my dog, who demands an adventure regardless of the weather, so he gets it. With the holidays coming up, now is a great time to grab them for yourself or as a gift. Scan the QR code or hit up Vessi.com for up to 45% off select styles for a limited time. Now, the theme with Ducati when you look at these super bikes is that if there's a performance gain to be had, even at the expense of complexity, they'll make it work. 
So sure, a V4 is a much more complicated engine than an inline four, but it offers significant advantages. All right, so why choose a V4? And first, let's compare it to a V2, because Ducati has used a lot of V2s, so why in this case are they using a V4? Well, again, remember, if you want more power, you either need a bigger engine or you rev higher. So if you want to make the engine bigger with a V2 versus a V4, well, that means you're going to need a larger bore, the width of your cylinders. And so if you increase the stroke, well, that means now your piston speeds are going to get faster. So ultimately, there's a limit on stroke. So if you want to increase the size of the engine, well, you have to increase that bore. Well, if you're increasing the bore, the width of the cylinders, that means you're now going to need larger intake valves. Well, larger intake valves are going to weigh more. They're going to have more mass. So it's more difficult to control that mass as these valves are moving up and down at very high speed. So if you use a V4, it means all of your parts, your cylinders, your valves are going to be smaller. They're going to have have less mass overall and you can put higher acceleration forces on them and thus rev higher. Okay, but if we're going to use four cylinders, why use a V4 rather than an inline four? Well, it comes down to several reasons, but overall looking at the packaging of it, it starts to make sense. So if you look at the bike from the front and you have an inline four engine, it's a pretty wide engine. And so because of that, your bike is going to be wider. It's going to have worse aero than if it was narrower with just that V2. So it's split where you only have the two cylinders in the front, two cylinders in the back. So this enables better aerodynamics and it also means you get better lean angles with that bike. You can also place the engine a bit lower, keeping the center of gravity lower, because as you can see with this I-4, if you lower it down, then you further are impacting those lean angles. And finally, the engine can act as a stressed member of the chassis. So because you've got that V coming into the back of the bike, you can use that back section of the V and actually make it a structural member of the bike versus the inline here where you have to create that additional structure and thus need additional material to improve the rigidity. Aligning with the mentality that increased complexity is acceptable if there's an increase in performance, Ducati is the only company in the world offering counter-rotating crankshafts on their road-legal production motorcycles. Many do it in motorsport, but Ducati is the only one bringing it to street bikes. All right, so what does this mean and why does Ducati do it? So if you look at pretty much any production bike out there on the road, it's going to have the wheels and the engine rotating in the same direction. So the front wheel, the rear wheel, of course, rotating clockwise as this bike travels to the right and the engine rotating clockwise along with it. Ducati swaps this around so that the engine is then rotating counterclockwise against the rotation of these wheels. And so why do they do this? Well, there's three big advantages. The first two being it helps prevent wheelies and it helps prevent stoppies. So in order to understand this, as you start to accelerate on a bike, of course, you're going to apply apply that force with the rear tire, that's going to have an equal and opposite force from the center of gravity, which makes that bike want to lean back, do a wheelie. Same thing happens with cars. So as you have that engine accelerating in the opposite direction, it's actually providing a torque that's trying to put that wheel, that front wheel back down on the ground. It's helping to prevent that wheelie from ever occurring. So I have my impact driver here to help demonstrate this. So of course, if we're looking at this engine here, it's rotating counterclockwise, right? So we see that counterclockwise. And if I accelerate it, you see it pushes this to the right. It's pushing that bike down. So if I'm going really slowly and then a quick acceleration, you can see it rotates this so that it goes and it helps prevent that wheelie. Now, what if I'm slowing the bike down? All right, so if you're decelerating the engine, the opposite occurs, and so it's gonna create an equal and opposite torque that's trying to push the rear of the bike down. So I'm going to spin this up really fast, then once it's really fast, I'm gonna let go, which means it's gonna slow down really quickly, and it's gonna provide that equal and opposite torque that while the engine is still rotating this way, this is also gonna to wanna to spin this way because of that deceleration. So spinning it up really fast, let it go, spinning it up really fast, let it go, you see it turns it to the right. So that is exactly what's going on with the engine. It's helping to prevent wheelies and helping to prevent stoppies through that equal and opposite torque when the engine is either accelerating or decelerating. But there's another cool effect from this and that has to do with when you're leaning the bike. So now we're getting into the gyroscopic effect. And so the rotation of the wheels actually causes the bike to resist wanting to lean. So the faster you're traveling, the more rotation you have in these wheels and they 
want to resist you from leaning left or right very quickly. So if your engine is also rotating in the same direction as your wheels, it's simply adding to that gyroscopic effect where the bike doesn't want to lean very quickly left or right. So if you have a counter rotating crankshaft, you're now subtracting that engine's effect on this gyroscopic effect from the equation. And so you're actually going to have a bike that feels lighter and more nimble and it's going to more easily lean left and right. So if you're going through a chicane, it's going to feel like a lighter bike. And finally, another fascinating innovation on Ducati's end involving their valve train, which again is complex, but offers a performance advantage, is their Desmodromic valve actuation, which helps enable such high RPM performance. All right, so let's look at several of the solutions out there as far as opening and closing intake valves and see how that compares to Ducati's solution. So looking at a typical street engine, you're going to have a camshaft, which will press on a little finger follower, and that will open up this intake valve pushing against this coil spring. So as that camshaft continues to rotate, that coil spring will then push back up, closing that intake valve. Now with this mechanical spring, its behavior is kind of lost at high RPM. You start to run into something called valve float where the control of that valve is no longer predictable. So it's good for low RPM applications, but it starts to lose its merit once you get into higher RPM applications. So what do they do in racing with really high revving engines? Well, they use pneumatic springs for that that valve. So you have an air spring, so that air pressure, of course, is a very predictable behavior, so you can use it at really high RPM. The challenge, of course, is that this has a really short life to it because you're maintaining that seal and you have to perfectly maintain the seal and ensure you have air pressure in order to maintain that spring's effectiveness. So, of course, these race engines, they get rebuilt each race. You add that air pressure back in. It lasts the life of the race. You don't have to worry about it. But for something like a road going bike, you're gonna want something that's going to last much longer so you don't have these crazy maintenance intervals. So what is Ducati's solution? So Ducati's solution is rather genius because it uses a mechanical cam for opening and closing. There are no springs required for this. So effectively, you have one cam that's opening the valve and you have another cam that's closing the valve. So here I've drawn it open, here I've drawn it closed. This cam right here is lowering it down at the same time while this rocker here allows for it to be lowered, then this purple cam here pushes against this and it raises that valve back up. Of course, looking at an animation of this makes it much more clear how it works, but for each set of valves, you can see how there's a camshaft for each and there's a rocker arm for each that pushes that valve down and then pushes that valve back up. And so the actuation is purely mechanical, no springs are required, and you can do this at a very high RPM, very effectively and very reliably. Reliably. And this is something, of course, completely unique and patented by Ducati. Now, something we didn't even get into is why they're using a 70 degree crank offset with a 90 degree V4 engine. And it turns into this really interesting discussion on firing order and firing interval. Perhaps in a future video, I'll cover that if people are interested in this. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.